This is Twit. Tonight I wanted to show you um, a particular coax that I like to use for, well, it's RG142. Uh, and, well, we'll just show you a little more about it. And also how to install a BNC connector. This originally aired in Alentrologic November 2016, but we haven't seen it here before. And if you're working with repeaters or, um, you know, some really low signal level applications, this might be just what you need. You know, I've been making up uh, a lot of uh, RF jumper cables and different things, getting ready to install uh, four one kilowatt FM transmitters at a site. And I needed a lot of different cables and things. And uh, this is a cable I had seen before, but you you may not have seen it. It's, uh, it's not used a lot, but uh, just something a little different that you could have an application for. I wouldn't suggest putting 100 feet out there to run to your dipole. It might be a little expensive for that. I'm sure. Yeah. Not cheap old man compliant. No. You know, there are a lot of different choices when you're looking for coaxial cable. Tonight, we're going to look at one that uh, you may not have seen before. It's RG142. It's a high-temperature coaxial cable that's widely used in commercial wireless applications. It also works very well in sensitive environments like avionics. RG142 can be used for radar. It's used a lot with GPS, medical systems, broadcast gear, test equipment, and you'll see it used a lot of times for jumpers at repeater sites. The reason is the double shielding of the cable. The center conductor is a 19 American wire gauge, silver-coated, copper-covered steel conductor. It's plenum rated, has a Teflon dielectric. It's got double silver-coated copper braid shields with 95% coverage and an FEP jacket. And because it's approved for direct burial, you can use RG142 coax and underground connections and still have good shielding efficiency. The cable was specifically built for the United States military in World War II. It's used for satellites, systems, and other tactical operations and equipment. Because of the importance of those cables, the military required them to have a maximum and minimum dielectric adhesion values, specific shrink-back allowances, eccentricity standardizations, stress crack resistance tests, and a lot of other specifications that add to the durability and reliability of the cable. RG142 utilizes standard connectors, so you don't need proprietary or exotic pieces. It has good shielding effectiveness between 40 and 60 dB and low passive intermod. Degradation of signal quality is kept to a minimum. That's why this cable works really good with repeater duplexers where you don't want any signal leaking around from the transmitter getting back into the receiver. Since RG142 is made with a solid dielectric, it has a high rate of crush resistance, and it's the coaxial cable of choice for tactical operations and applications. Here's some things that kind of set it apart. Temperature-wise, it's good from minus 67 degrees to 395 degrees Fahrenheit. You're not going to do that with your average coax. It's also solder and solvent resistant. Let's just do a few comparisons here. RG8X, which we're all fairly familiar with, and I'll use it because it's a similar size coax. It's usable out to 1 gigahertz. RG142 is usable to 8 gigahertz. Now, the loss of RG142 is a little higher. At 100 megahertz, RG8X has an attenuation of 3.1 dB per 100 feet. Well, RG142 is 3.8, a little lossier there. But let's look at the power rating. At 100 megahertz, RG8X is good out to 250 watts. RG142 is good to 2400 watts. I like to use it for critical jumpers and broadcast installations and sensitive test equipment in high RF fields. Now I'm going to show you today 
how to install a BNC coax connector because that's something I needed to do. I'm going to show you a few hints here that'll make it go maybe a little bit easier and a little more accurate. I'm using a good quality one here. This one is silver plated. It's not the cheapest connector around, but then again, this cable is not that cheap. When you start looking around online, you find it goes from um, 4 to $5 a foot. So why not spend a little extra on a good connector for it? A standard BNC connector for RG58 would fit this cable just fine. Now, whenever you're going to install a coax connector, or really any type of connector for that matter, if you don't know exactly the length that you should strip back your cable, well, let me show you a little trick here. The first thing you want to do, and I recommend you get one of these anyway, pick up one of these cheap calibers here. You can find them on sale at Harbor Freight for less than $20.00. This is going to make it much easier to do your cable measurements here. I'll just put it on inches, make sure that it's zeroed, calibrated. Now, how do I know how much of this to strip back? Well, I go to the website for the connector that I'm interested in, and I downloaded the spec sheet for it. And we can see right here, they almost always give you a recommended cable stripping dimensions there. If we strip back to these exact dimensions, then we can be sure that this is going to be a good connector installation. If I'm only doing a single cable, well, I'll just take my calipers out here and adjust it out to the sizes that I need. 1.57. Lock it down there. Get it right on the money, which is, uh, you know, a little challenge when you're working with us figures that small. Now this diagram is not to scale as you can see, but this is how much of the center conductor we need sticking out. So if I'm doing a single cable, well, I'll just cut it based on that and go through each of them there. But you know, I've got a, a fair amount of this cable. I'm going to be putting on a lot of connectors. So to make the job go a little bit quicker, I took a piece of plastic from a connector shell and I measured it out. I've got one division here for 0.157 then I've got another one for the 0.146 that we need for the dielectric to stick out and then 0.327 for the shield. And that's just a handy little gauge I can use here since I know that I'm going to be doing a lot of these in the future. So we can put our calipers away. Now for BNC connectors, yeah, I'm not a big fan of crimp on connectors generally, but for these, I am. Now I will crimp that center pin as well, but I'm also going to solder it. And there's a little hole in the side where you can flow solder into it. If you've ever tried to put a standard BNC connector together where you've got the little nut on the back, Boy, this is so much easier, and you're going to do a much better job with it. It's easiest if you start right at the end and work your way back rather than go the other direction. The first thing I'm going to do is take my little gauge here, or the calipers. I'm going to determine how much of that center conductor I need sticking through. That much right there. So I'll begin cutting the cable right there using a sharp knife. I've got to go through two shields, and that's the first thing I'm going to try to do here. I don't want to go all the way through and nick the center conductor. Now let's just check it to make sure that we are the right length, and yeah, we're exactly where we need to be on that. So now we're going to take the dielectric off. i got to be real careful here. I only want to just cut the dielectric and not nick that center conductor because that'll weaken our connection if we do that. This stuff here is Teflon too so it's a really good dielectric. The next thing we need to do is strip back just enough of the shield there so that we've exposed the correct amount of dielectric. Let's take another measurement here to see that everything's good so far and it is right on the money. The next step is to expose the correct amount of shield and 
Just want to cut through the jacket here, not cut into the shield itself. And let's check that dimension. It's right on the money too. The next thing we do is a step that you really need to try to remember, and that's to slide this back down the cable, get it out of the way. So you've got your ring to crimp down. Put our pin on the center conductor there. Of course, you're going to need the correct size of crimping tool. And I just happen to have one here back from when we used to install networks using RG58 cable. It's the correct size for this as well. And there we go. Slide the pin up inside the connector. Pull the shell back up. And there we go. Nice strong BNC connector. So if you're going to put a coax connector on and you're not positive of how to strip it back, download the spec sheet and do yourself a favor. Go by Harbor Freight, pick up one of these cheap calibers here. I found it to be pretty doggone accurate. It's really saved me a lot of time. Yeah, those <laughs> are those calipers. Yeah, I use yeah. them all the time. Especially, I bought them to use with my 3D printer, but yeah. I find it kind of handy to measure a lot of stuff. What do you think about this cable? Yeah. This stuff just looks expensive. It is. It's, it's, very expensive. it's heavy, too, man. Yeah. I, yeah, I've seen, I think I've seen people using that in, like, a patch panel bay. Yeah. Uh, to, you know, go, I don't know that they used BNC, but I've seen those before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll see them uh, on repeaters uh, a lot for connecting the duplexers together. Here, I don't think I can get it close enough. You can really yep. see it. But, uh, yeah, it, I on test equipment, uh, broadcast installation. This is really good cable. <laughs> yep. Ooh. And it is really good cable. You know, um, I first used it with some test equipment before we had these handheld antenna analyzers. Well, and, and still in uh, AM broadcast, we use uh, antenna bridge, which is a little more expensive than the handheld analyzer. And uh, I had a synthesizer detector that I used with that uh, to simulate a transmitter. And we're getting some leakage. The, the antenna impedance readings just weren't very repeatable. They were just kind of crazy. And uh, I was using uh, regular RG58 to patch those two instruments together. So I went and, um, and bought some of this. Fixed up a couple of patch cords, put it on there, eliminated the problem altogether. Someone suggested that to me. I don't remember who it was now. That was 30 years ago, probably. But uh, there's definitely good uses for double-shielded cable when you're working with tiny signals especially.